let's get into some arch toppery today. I'm going to start off with an Epiphone Emperor from the 1990s. I'm fond of these guitars. I owned an Emperor Regent at one point, and I've worked on several of them. This one had a traumatic experience at one point where there was a slight separation between the neck and the fingerboard down at the end here, which glued up really nicely. There is, however, a bit of a sympathetic buzz, a weird transient thing that's going on, and it's coming from a loose brace. As you can imagine, guitar repair people scream a little bit inside when this occurs, because it's bad enough on a flat top guitar where it can be difficult to reach some areas. On a monster like this, with a full 18 inch wide body, there are areas where it's, practically speaking, it's impossible to get to the ends of the braces. Luckily it's not that common. Usually the braces are fitted pretty carefully to the shape of the soundboard, and they're not under a whole lot of stress. However, if it falls at some point or gets dropped while it's in the case, that can be enough to shock them free. The owner actually managed to get his phone in one of the F-holes, and he took a pick of the loose end of the brace and he sent it to me. Um, I'm going to use my borescope to confirm and have more of a look around to make sure that there aren't other areas. This is the treble side brace, and yes, there is definitely a separation between the brace and the top. It almost looks like there's a crack in the brace wood itself. And is it me, or is that grain running parallel to the soundboard, opposite to the way they're usually made? And it seems the base side brace might also be loose. You can see the marking of the pencil line there for its position. And it's also got funny grain, too. I stuck a knife in there, and yes, it's separated for a couple of inches. I had a look on the next side of things as well. That end seems to be okay. The braces are glued down. There's the interesting laminated neck block and the upper support and the screw coming through from the pick guard. So the end of the brace is somewhere around here, so just within reach of my palette knife. There can't be any pretense about working cleanly in this situation. I'm going to put some paper towel in there to keep it off the back, but there's it's going to be sloppy with glue along each side of the brace. It's just, there's no way I can really do much except for, you know, wipe with my finger through the hole. So that's that's what I have to do to my knife to make this work. The geometry is more complex than at first glance, as the top is arching upwards and away from the F-hole. It's very difficult to come up with an angled tool for applying glue that will follow that angle and also allow you to slide back and forth and keep contact with the soundboard, because the shape and distance of the F-hole from the brace continually changes as you move along its length. Try it sometime. You'll enjoy it. And you'll notice I'm doing this with strings on. I really want to keep things exactly the way they are when the guitar is under string tension. I managed to not press record while applying the glue, but to be honest you wouldn't see very much anyway. Just me moving back and forth with the palette knife while I peer into a little mirror. And these clamps just fit through the hole. I kind of got lucky. Yeah, it's no fun. I'm quite certain this is going to be one of the messiest glue-ups I've ever done. You know, there's going to be glue on top of the brace, on the side of the brace, probably on the top of the guitar. Sort of splashed around, because you're working upside down and backwards looking into a mirror. And um, at the very end of your tool's reach. So, still look pretty on the outside though. See, there's glue on top of the brace. It was too far to reach in and clean off with anything I had that would hold a paper towel. Here's an exceptionally lovely 1927 Gibson L3. This is one of those early round hole arch tops that sonically have a lot going for them, but they've been kind of overshadowed by their F-hole counterparts. This is a 13 fret model. It joins the body at the 13th fret. Um, smaller body size. Um, so some of the jazz guys thought it was too quiet. That's debatable. They're also quite lightly built, except for one thing. 
they have some of the biggest necks you're ever likely to find. I'm not kidding. You need big hands to play this thing. I have big hands, so maybe it's not a great comparison, but your average player, you got to really reach for those strings. This one is in pretty fabulous shape, but the owner would like me to switch over the tuners for a set we took off a recent National. It's also had a modification to the original bridge base. Someone reshaped it without regard to symmetry, so we'll endeavor to straighten that out. A couple of people actually tagged me on this guitar in a Facebook Marketplace ad a couple of months back because people were contending that it looked too good and therefore it must be fake. And the, uh, of course that made me scrunch up my eyes real tight and I pinched the bridge of my nose and I made this weird whimpering sound like because uh, the idea of faking an L3 makes no sense. It would take the same amount of time and effort to create a spurious L5 and you would make double your money. Or maybe not, because logistically the amount of effort involved to create the jigs and learn how to finish this thing so it looked real, the aging techniques and everything, you would be ten or twelve thousand dollars worth of time and materials into a project that might net you, what, five or six. So, ugh, I just want people to think, is this the original finish? I'd say yes, unequivocally. What about the label? It's in very good shape. But that kind of stands to reason because the whole guitar is in really good shape. Let's have a look at the lopsided bridge. On the bottom, there are some concentric looking mill marks. And a little bit of sanding. Is it possible this is factory original shape? I can't believe that. Um, you can see the disparity in thickness between the ends of the feet here. There's about like three millimeters worth of extra space on the base side. I think I'm apt to try and graft on a piece of ebony to make up the difference, rather than attempting to cut a whole new base, because that's a lot of work, and um, it should be pretty hard to detect when I'm done. That's nice, it's got a little patent stamp on it. The pencil lines will let me keep track of where I'm removing material. The other fascinating thing about these compensated bridges is if you get one that hasn't been cut down, if you flip it over, they've got a standard straight saddle cut into it. Funny, huh? I'll sand the bottom of the foot flat to glue on the addition, which I'll make out of some scrap ebony from a fingerboard offcut. I'll work both the surfaces until they fit together perfectly. I've padded the jaws of my clamps with cork, so I won't make dents in the bridge. So the tuners are a bit stiff and cantankerous, and the owner has a set that should just drop in. They have a higher gear ratio for more refined tuning, and he's hoping they'll be easier on the hand. Very similar. Same spacing and shape. These originals are Waverly's and they say patent applied for. Even the decorative engraving is similar, so the new ones will look very much at home. Just one little issue. The original bushings are pinched in slightly at the base and they won't slip over the new shafts. They're maybe three thousandths of an inch wider than the old ones. So I had to sand off that little burr there. Just a couple of strokes on the paper and then they go right in. I'll put the screws in and they're ready to go. The bridge base is dry now, so I'll begin trimming off the excess on the graft. Start off with a hand plane, taking very gentle cuts. Then go on to some sandpaper. I'll sand off the end so that it blends. And I use a chisel to trim off the inside corner. The base foot is now oversized, so I'll take off some of that excess with a diagonal cut, aiming to make the foot thickness match the treble side. This will just remove some bulk that uh, I would otherwise have to sand off. That's a good starting point. To match the new foot to the top radius, I'll have to scrape and sand it. I don't want to change the treble foot shape, so I've got a strip of masking tape on the sandpaper under it. On newer guitars I just tape the abrasive to the top, but I'm wary of that in this case. 
That matches pretty closely. Speaking of the finish, there are a couple of blemishes the owner wants me to seal up, so they won't propagate into more loss of lacquer. I'm going to clean up and polish the frets. It's quite possible that I'll be doing a refret on this at some point in the near future. Uh, not because they're worn out. Um, there are some string divots, but they're not too bad. It's just they're really, really tiny. And it can feel weird to the modern hand. And This player likes something bigger. So that raises the question. On a guitar that's so nicely preserved, is it a sin to do a refret? The question can be tackled from a number of viewpoints, and I don't know if any of them are really the right answer. Um, the person who owns it is going to play it, and if they put out the money, a change that is something that will make it more playable for them seems entirely warranted, you know. And if need be, it could always be refretted and brought back to the original specs. I doubt there are very many people out there who would want that. If someone wanted to paint it green, however, I'd probably say no to that job. Something about its place in the cultural history of instruments tells me that's not a great idea. On the scale of sacrilege, new frets have got to be like a 0 0.5. Whereas something like drilling holes in the soundboard and installing a Nashville-style bridge, um, that would be up there around a 9. I don't know what 10 is. Polishing, polishing, make it shiny. Hey, this bridge has been fitted to the top arch, and it still looks a little unbalanced. It's because at the factory, one foot was sanded into this deep S-shaped undulation. In architectural molding terms, it might be called a sima recta. Whereas on the base side, it comes out straight, and it's been left almost as a quarter round. Um, you can see it on the top as well, how much deeper the sanding drum went in here, and on this side it didn't touch at all. So I'm debating at this moment whether I should go ahead and introduce that recurve into it. On the guitar it does look a little more bulbous as opposed to the treble side. It's definitely more elegant. I think I should do it. it seems to have been made with an inch and a half sanding drum. You only get one shot at this, so you better do it right on this 90-year-old part. This saddle intonates very nicely. I'm finding the correct location with the outside E strings. On some guitars it's necessary to tape or pin the bridge in place so it doesn't migrate away from center. This one sits just fine and doesn't want to slide. That's all set. People ask about stringing old arch tops, and should they use lighter gauges? And the answer is, not necessarily. It depends on the instrument. In general, arch top designs are physically stronger than the flat tops, and they're less prone to distortion, due in large part to the way the force is applied to the soundboard. Uh, much of the tension is transferred via the tailpiece to the end block and the sides, and the actual downward pressure on the bridge doesn't equal what happens when you have strings anchored through the soundboard with all the twisting and pulling that happens on a flat top. So yeah, usually you can put 13s on with no problem. Uh, if you had a flat top made in the 1920s I would usually suggest lighter gauges or um, conscientious detuning when you're not playing. And of course keep it in a case. I guarantee you this thing spent its life in a case when it wasn't making music. It's probably the best way to keep a guitar in good shape. This thing's coming up on 100 years old, and it looks better than some 10-year-old guitars I've worked on this week. Hey, that looks good to me. The graft is not visible to the naked eye. I really like this guitar.